Welcome back to another episode of the Mind of George Show. And this one feels like a fly on the wall or breaking the fourth wall because today's episode is literally with one of my mentors, dear friends, brothers, partners in crime, soul brothers, who is somebody I admire, look up to, and is a master. And I mean a true Renaissance man and master with the way of his words, with creation, with art, understanding tech, processes, practice, and all of these beautiful little things. And we broke the wall because this is my brother and I, we have tears, we have deep conversations, and we really dialed in on how we're creating art in every moment and celebrating the art that we are and how we get to develop a relationship with progress and process. And in the world that we're in today, things change so quick. And we've always heard that we have to be fast. We have to be quick. And this one really, really takes art, takes creation, takes the gift that you are, whether you're in your business as a products business, a service business, a, a influencer, creator, real estate, it doesn't matter because everything we create in the world with our words, with our content, it's art and it's about progress and understanding that process. And we break it all down, plus our own personal pieces, how we manage it, how we mitigate it, how we see it, and how we're all on the same journey, growing, getting better together. And my brother, Nikhil, is a magician with words, meaning I normally have to have a dictionary around me, but I ask him on the show to define the beautiful words that he uses. But this was a masterful dance in the creative process and really understanding how we win in this world and what we're creating. And so without further ado, I would like to get into the show. Thank you in advance for listening. Thank you, brother Nikhil, for being on the show. Thank you for sharing your genius, your wisdom, and helping all of these incredible entrepreneurs that are about to listen to this unlock their superpowers and really turn the volume knob of their light up, get it brighter, get it out into the world and make a difference. And so get ready, get a notebook ready, get ready to pause, get ready to listen, get ready to do it all. And I can't wait to hear your feedback. So shoot me a DM. Let me know how it goes. I love you all to pieces. Let's get into the show. All right, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of The Mind of George Show. This one feels special because he's like my brother and my like life partner and one of my like coaches and dear friends and mentors and poets and renaissance men and just walking embodiment of like everything I feel like I strive to be as a man as well as an entrepreneur and a friend and a genius and his understanding of tech and knowledge and every level of language that you could ever speak in any form of anything to deliver a poetic clarity and install it into your soul is, is the gentleman who is gracing us with his presence today. And in full disclosure, I looked at him and I was like, Nikhil, we're bros, bro. Like, I ain't got an agenda. We can just coffee this thing. He's like, yeah. And then before this, we've been talking for, you know, a half an hour. And I'm like, this might turn into my raw therapy session or something of massive value or some coffee conversations to ponder on, or we talk about all of it, but who knows? And I'm just so ready for the ride. And so Nikhil, without further ado, I'd love to officially welcome you onto the show, bro. Oh, thank you, brother. What can I say? It's just like, it's just magic and alchemy and so much richness just conversating with you and connecting with you. And I love how we flow together and the depth and how quickly we can just go to those places. And it's so beautiful. And you are such a potent mirror in my life and I am celebrating this moment and this opportunity to be here with you and all these listeners and and honoring whatever comes through knowing that it's it's perfectly divine and I'm here for it oh bro I had a thought like a week and a half ago when we were messaging right before the event you know when we were doing the uh it was like you did four minutes I came back with four you came back with six I came back with six you hit eight I hit eight and we were doing yeah. that exchange I had a thought and I was like God, this would be the most valuable conversation to like share with people that are wondering like what behind the scenes mm. conversations are when like friends or business people support each other. And then I was like, yeah, for real. And then you even just alluded to it at the beginning of this. And, and I've had a couple of instances lately, and I think this will give you something mm. to chew on where I've been on calls with my best clients, my absolute favorite clients. I, they're all my favorite, they're family, but like, We'll get on a call and they'll have a list of like seven questions for me, right? And within the first 10 minutes of the call, we are through the entire list. It's like question. I'm like, I might try this, this. They're like, okay, next. And I've had two friends with me when I've been on calls with them. And they were like, that was the most valuable thing we've ever witnessed. I was like, what do you mean? They're like, 
they have like no resistance. Neither do you. It's like, if they have an idea, you're like, mm -hmm. okay, how do we do it? I'm like, yeah. And they're like, you give them an idea. They're like, oh yeah, we could do it this way. I was like, isn't that the point mm -hmm. that we're all doing this is to, to be in decision territory and like instantly find the meat. And then I forget that like, it's a muscle that isn't practiced often. And then you even said it to me, but that's something I crave about our conversations that I didn't even realize till this moment. Like it'll be a week or you went to India for a what was yeah, it a month? month a month and like the occasional downloads but then it's like the moment we hear from each other no no there's no surface we're like seven hundred thousand feet below the surface and i was like holy moly here we out here now like that's probably one of my favorite things is like how instant deep we go when we talk uh yeah thank you for 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 sharing that and i mean it's like my my soul yearns for that that richness and that depth because it's in that depth that all the all the diamonds are forged in like the the core of the planet and i love i love that space and like you i think we're comfortable in the traversing of the light and the dark and going all in and it's yeah it's soul food truly it, it's soul food I, I feel like i crave that soul food like that's like the thing that gives me, but it's so interesting too, because that soul food gives me so much light. And sometimes on the other side, so much mm. darkness to walk through, to feel, to find the light, but I love it. And I welcome it. I'm like, stretch me, bro. I'm like, like actually for everybody listening to this, we've been recording for four and a half minutes. I'll be honest about this. I've spoken for three and a half. And in the one minute you've spoke, I almost need a dictionary for three of the words already. <laughs> Right. And this is what I love about you <laughs> so much. <laughs> it's like, we'll have a conversation about like me being in my shadows or struggling with perspective or just even some things. Right. And you'll share the most profound. And I mean, the most profound breakthroughs for me, but they won't land for like a week because my, my little nerdy brain is like, I still don't know what those words mean. And then I like open up a dictionary and I close the loop on the words and then your message hits my soul. And I was like, holy moly. And then I have this new vocabulary to use. So I have to thank you for that. I one. love it. They're like time delay truth bombs that are seeded and they just unlock and when the time is right. Yeah, bro. You're like slow release. Like it, it's like perfect. Like you like, you like plant the seed and sow it so well. And you're like, oh yeah, yeah. Boom. And then I'm like, oh, oh. And then I have your beautiful words to dance with. And I'm starting to collapse the gap of like using them in the right context and making sure I know what they mean. But I feel like you sharpen me so much with the things that are just naturally who you are. Well, thank you. And you do the same for me with respect to grounding me in the, in the reality, right? And it's like this beautiful, beautiful dance. And I oh, like words, like words are seeds and they're constructs that birth worlds, right? Like and yes. worlds and words, they're not that far apart uh, phonetically as well. And, you know, in, in the beginning was the word and the word was God and, you know, here we are, wording with each other. Like, even, even that, you're like, words create, words are the construct that creates worlds. And I was like, I can chew on that for like the next 10 years. Like, there's like 700 keynotes underneath that fortune cookie and 800 questions that I just love. And I have a question now, actually, because I've never asked you this. Go for it. So, Though Nikhil that I've known, my whole knowing of Nikhil has always been like a wordsmith, a word poet, right? But like, where did the, like that, even, even your proclivity to understand the power of words and know where they come from, hmm. right? Like, has that been here your whole life or is that something that you found as a byproduct of exploring for something or like, where did you get to the point? Like, you're so eloquent, but even, even that, like, where hmm. did that come from? You know, that's a really great question, which I've never been asked before. And just reflecting back on my life, it's always, it's always been there in some capacity. And I could, I guess, connect it to maybe previous lives and being able to cultivate that. And like, for example, my, my sister, she is a brilliant, world-class author, writer. Like her, like you think you need a dictionary for my words? I read my sister's writing and I'm like, I, don't, I got no clue. 
<laughs> what that word is, but it sounds beautiful and it fits in there so perfectly. So I guess it's just in the in the in the lineage in some capacity, and it's it's how I how I connect with the world is through mm, like through exploring new perspectives through words that allow me to see new dimensions. And I guess like you, I just like to collect things and absorb information and knowledge and a word comes into my reality and it sticks there like a seed. Mm. Maybe I'm just attracting yes. seeds that are sprouting and then I'm sowing them through sharing them with others and speaking them into existence. But yeah, no clear answer, but that's the answer I have for you right now, brother. No, that's 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 clear. I picked up a new word in Austin, insular. Mm. I'm, I'm, that's a new one mm. I picked up because someone I did my two word check in, yeah. right? And at this event, I had like three first words in in eight years of me doing my own two word check in, and like I was like, huh? And one of them was like insular, and I was like, that is such a good word. Like it speaks so much. It's like, no, no, I'm here, and. I'm protecting myself and I'm just choosing to see you from the inside mm. out versus you seeing me from the in outside in. And I was like, and then we talk so much about words and, and things like that. And then everybody called me out for the rest of the event because I used the word. I'm like, no, no, I pick them up quick. Uh -huh. I pick them up quick. The only problem is when I pick them up with the wrong definition. <laughs> like when I, I picked up pontificate from Gary years ago when we were at an event together or something. And I think I used it in the wrong context for two years before somebody <laughs> told me that I was like, like, you know, that word doesn't mean what you think it means. Right. And I was like, I've probably used that word 1700 times and not one person has said anything to me. And so I, I love your, your breakdown of that. Now, do you, do you, do you like, you know, like you're so like your learning modalities, like how you consume, do you consume, like words in general, like, do you love looking at like what words mean and where they come from? Because you also like break down words so well. Is that something mm. that came after or is this something you pursue like your vocabulary because you write and you express yourself? Or is it like a byproduct of just using the muscle? And then over time, the more you use it, the more you dig into mm. it. I think it's a, it, it's a combination because I do recollect many times when a word comes into my reality I'll literally really quickly just boom definition and but that's all I need it just in that instance it it sits there and there's definitely times yeah. like that and then there's some words that like I'll maybe hear for the first time and I intuitively just know what it what it means because it's it's it it sounds like what it means whereas some words don't mm -hmm. funnily enough and I'm a massive fan of etymo etymology and the exploration of yeah. the root because this is unpacking creation yeah that 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 see that's where i'm like i'm trying to like find like and and for everybody listening like they kill and i are like really incredibly close friends and i've never asked him these in personal <laughs> conversations so i'm like we might as well ask <laughs> when we're on the podcast because i i feel that now with you right like i i see you right right you write mm. all the time right like for me as a creator like a creative my preferred medium is video mm -hmm. Right. I just, I feel like I can express myself with no filter. I feel like it just allows me to be myself. But if you ask me to, like, for example, on the flight to Austin, I started writing a post, right? I saw a Facebook post and I was like, oh, I'm going to write a post about this. And I was like, oh. So then I have like an initial post that's like three sentences, right? And then I'm like, oh, but it could go there and it could go there. And then I have cliff notes below. And then I end up writing like 88 books <laughs> and I try to put it all in one. And then I'm like, I'll sit there for four hours, but if you ask me to do it on video, I can do it in about 35 to 40 seconds. Mm. And so even this morning, I was looking at that. I was like, I was writing this for five days. And I was like, when am I going to post this? And this morning I was like, screw it. Just read it on video. <laughs> and then I read it and it like filled in the gaps. But, you know, for you, I watch you write. I watch you speak. I watch you do video. Do you have like is there a modality that you prefer that helps you the most? Like, is it writing or is it speaking or which mm. one do you prefer? You know, I, I, in, I enjoy both. And it's interesting because I feel like when I'm, when I'm writing, it's almost like I'm reconstituting my mind or, you know, defragging a hard drive in some capacity. And there's some real alchemy in that. And like, I've been missing writing over the last couple of months because I felt in some level creatively blocked with writing, which is an interesting thing. And 
Yeah, and I realize that when I'm not writing, I feel more tense and I harbor some resentment. And I'm like, but I don't know what to write about. And I know it's all part of my cyclical process of being a creative. And I love writing and I'm ready for more of it. And um, I'm also challenged at times in that process. That tickled something in me too, because I just finished the event and you know, and I, you and I mm. were talking before about the event, um, about like what it feels like for me and, and for context for everybody here, we were at my event. I'm so present. Like my phone went off <laughs> the day before the event and it didn't really get looked at again until I was flying home. But then in that I felt naked at times, right? So present, but also part of me felt unexpressed. And I realized this morning, Nikhil, that the moment I recorded that video that I recorded this morning, it was like two mm -hmm. minutes, right? It was a quick Instagram story, Facebook. I felt like alive again. And I was like, oh, there's clarity. And I was like, oh, actually as a byproduct of my container as well, like my own creative process and outlet, like even though I'm speaking in front of them and I'm doing it, there's something between like me and my phone mm -hmm when I record them, because before that I have pen to paper and I'm like, oh, here's my thought. Here's the word. Here's, here's the blank. And so I actually feel that as well, like at a deep visceral level, because I, when I feel that block, typically it's like, oh, I don't know what to say. I don't, I don't know what to do. And then I'm like, well, this is something you could say. And I hit record and all of yes. a sudden it's gone. And it's like the whole sky opens up. <laughs> And look, I, I feel the same way around video and you're such a master of video and I, I draw inspiration from you. And like when I do jump on video, like words just flow, like words just flow automatically and they don't need to be perfectly curated. Although even when I'm writing and when it's flowing, it feels like it's not really my, it's maybe it's my hand, but there's a presence that's inside of me that's just picking and choosing the next words. And it's like, it's a rhythmic expression rather than something that's like yeah. rational or, or linear. Yeah. Oh God. I love that. And then didn't you say before we started to like, you're starting to make like writing blank pages or sheets a part of your day. Again? Yeah. So um, some of you may know of morning pages, which is um, a really powerful process. It just looks like every morning as part of your, your ritual, you would just, open up your journal and write two pages. Now there's no, like the intention behind the writing is just literally putting pen to paper. If you don't know what to write, you just say, I don't know what to write. But sooner rather than later, you realize that you're having a discourse with your, your deep subconscious. And like, and it's just like, ah, the valve is open. And I've been doing that since India and it's been phenomenal. I was yeah. going to say, yeah, I, um, Oh, I have so many things, but I'm going to leave that one because I actually want to talk about mm -hmm. India. I would love to talk about yeah. India because we haven't, I mean, we've talked and I know where you were there, but can you give context for everybody kind of like why you were going sure. to India, where you're in India, and then you can go anywhere you want with that. But like, I'd love for everybody to kind of know because you were just there for a minute. Yeah. And, oh, and this, this um, homecoming, this pilgrimage, which I have been feeling into, like it's going to appear in my reality in the next few years. It just manifested so quickly and my heritage is, is Indian. I was born in um, Bombay, which is now called Mumbai. And I was there for the first five years of my life. And then my family migrated to Perth, Western Australia. And that was a massive shift as you could imagine. And, you know, I lived there till I was 21 and moved to Dubai and all of that. And I'd been back to India a few times, maybe four or five times in my, in my life. And I've got dear, dear memories of not just being in Bombay, but also visiting Goa, which is where uh, my mom's lineage is from. And Goa is a beautiful place. And I've got these pristine memories of my grandfather walking with me down the golden sand beach and just the beauty of it. And, and Goa has changed and India has changed. And I've only really been to Bombay or Goa and what happened was in December, um, a friend of mine and a, and a community member of Asraya, whom had connected to me very synchronistically early in January, um, she felt an intuitive hit to invite some leaders in a field to, to India um, for a pilgrimage slash experimental experience kind of anchored around um, Zach Bush visiting there as well as they're, they're connected and has been speaking at their hospital. And she just felt the intuitive hit. And I was like, you know what? It's about 
four weeks away and yes, this feels right. And I just said instantaneous yes and made it a reality. And there was a, um, a, a schedule and an itinerary. Firstly, to um, be in um, Bombay for a few days and just kind of connect with community there and see the inner workings of the, the company that Krisha's um, husband is the executive director of. And then we would go to a regenerative farm, uh, which is owned by their family, about two and a half hours out of Bombay in the hill country, which was phenomenal. Then staying at their family house up in the Western Ghats, which had views like Avatar, like truly, like I was like, whoa. By the way, that area, the valley in those mountains with regenerative farmers is the most biodiverse region in the world, like legitimately in wow. India right there. And, oh, wow. and that was like the first part of the trip. And I'll, I'll do the, the, the whole run, the run through and then we can tune into some of the pieces. And Perfect. Um, after, after that, we flew to, um, to, um, to Chennai, South India, to Tamil Nadu. And then we drove about three and a half hours to an ashram over there. We were invited by um, an individual that's also cultivating community that had met my, my host and was bringing in leaders to experience this ashram. And that was a very, very deep and eye-opening experience around the polarity of, of religion and spirituality. And that's a whole deep dive right there. And after that, we went to Oroville, which is a... Um, have you heard of Oroville, George, before? I haven't. Okay. No, I haven't. I've heard of the other places, okay. but I haven't heard of so Oroville. In, in 1968, like 120 delegates from different countries came with soil and put it into an urn to inaugurate this town, this area of land called Oroville, which was essentially mandated by the Indian government to be an experiment in, in elevating human consciousness and being a place with no religion and politics and money. And it, it was traced back. Um, the creator was Sri Aurobindo. So Oroville comes from Aurobindo, who actually was the precursor to the free thought in in India, like Gandhi was one of his students and he had been jailed for a year because he was speaking this phenomenal truths. And he had an ally called the mother who was a, a French Egyptian woman that, you know, co-inaugurated the place. So we were there learning around community building and also a 53 year old community, conscious community that is now going through massive shifts and transformation with India wanting to take it back and all of that. So we were going there as also delegates to support and to learn around governance and community. And then after that, me and my partner went to Kerala and we were stayed at this gorgeous, incredible, beautiful resort, the most stunning place I've ever been in my life to integrate for a few days and then back to Bombay to spend some family time because I still have family there. And I was there for my grandmother's 85th birthday um, so that was how the, the journey, the journey ended. So high level, that was the experience. I love it. Now I would love to know, like, what is your like most profound personal takeaway yes. that you have like installed? And then like, what's one that you're unpacking that you're like dancing mm. with? So the most profound personal takeaway was how important it was to reconnect to my mother the motherland mm. and the, and to, to give context as a Indian boy, five years old, whom also didn't feel Indian because his mother was going Catholic who only spoke English and not really feeling Hindu because my dad never really practiced. Then going to Australia and being different and then adjusting to that culture and almost severing my connection to my Indian hood and almost seeing it as less than like how connecting there is bringing back this part of me that I've just felt so it's just been lost somewhere and how much it, it just, it's been so alive to feel that. And what's emerging from that is home. I feel home in India. I'm going to live there for half the year now and kind of do this dance and the people and the, the spiritual tradition that's alive there. It just cracked me open. So yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, I can I can feel that, dude. I don't know if you saw, but we we had an incredible guest on the podcast, and 
She's 15 okay. in India. Okay. And, oh, she hasn't been on the podcast. She's come, I, I will have her on the show. But we ended up on a call. And, and she's been with me on Instagram for a few years. And, and I didn't even put two and two together. And she ends up on my calendar. And I end up, like, crying for 30 minutes on a call with her, like, thanking her, like, for inspiring me, for being, like, 14 years old, 15 years old, email marketing from India, focusing on relationships mm. and copy uh, the conscious way and caring about people, but like embodying that whole culture. Like I got on a call and all I just felt was love like this 15 year old, incredibly mm. like vibrant, radiant life giver working all the way from over here in our world and like ending up together. And I was like, I have so much I get to learn, mm. like so much I get to learn. I was like, I think I started that at 37, 37, right? So yeah, like even culturally, when you speak about that, like I felt it. And then her and I cried at the end of the call because we were talking about God and spirituality and connectedness and that feeling of home and the feeling of how it feels to be there and giving people that feeling on the internet. And like, the, ah, like that, like, like culturally, like that feeling is my goal to bring on the internet for everybody. <laughs> wow. I, I, I love yeah. that. Like, in, uh, my partner Aurora made an observation around, you know, there's, there's chaos in India, right? Like, there's, you know, things, yeah, there's, yeah. there's, you know, dirt and traffic and, and chaos. But amidst all of that, there's so much beauty, like this village woman wearing these beautiful saris with like these rich, rich colors and they're so put together. The traffic, people are honking, but it's like a, a symphony of honking because they're letting each other know that they're flowing together. And it's this contrast of like light and darkness that just feels so true and nothing is, nothing is hidden. It's, it's, it's in plain sight. And that's really refreshing coming from a Western perspective where things are really sterile and somewhat, you know, it's, it's a different experience altogether. So yeah, it was, it was a lot. Well, dude, I can, t I, do you remember when I came back from Bali in September, we had talked and I was describing it. I was like, dude, it's like spiritual yeah. Manhattan. It is the most beautiful juxtapositioned image or scene or scenario that I've ever been into. And I can only explain hmm. it of like, you have traffic everywhere, roads that aren't big enough, people honking, people doing whatever. And then throughout the day, in that culture, watching them respect their values and know who they are, be connected, stay in their prayer. But yet they'll be praying and in ceremony and there'll be 80 tourists from Australia and other countries walking around, snapping photos, walking in between. But like it doesn't affect them or bother them. And it's just these multiple things all mm. happening at the same time. And then it reminds me of like when I was, dude, I, I actually don't think I've ever talked about this on the podcast, but when I deployed to Somalia, I was 19 years mm. old. Right. Like I came from what everybody knows I came from. And then I'm like, oh, yeah, boom, deployed 19 years old into, you know, one of the most war torn parts of the world, countries, all of it. But like, I'll never forget of like being there deployed there is is what I would consider darkness. Right. It's not like a good thing. And boom. But then I'd like, be out on mission and 12 miles out in the middle of nowhere and meet a little kid who's hawking gum on the side of the road with no shoes, who's never even seen ice in their life, like never even seen ice, didn't even know ice existed, didn't know what half the stuff we had was, but then in that moment, nothing but beauty and love and simplicity and connection. And like, I feel like people ask me all the time, like, well, I do what I do. And I'm like, when you see that at mm. 19, it might take 20 years to land, mm. but when it lands, it lands. And like that feeling you're talking about, that contrast, like that, that gave me goosebumps, like all the way to my core, because like, I remember those moments and I remember how grateful they were for like the smallest of things that I take for granted every day and that I, I forget about, but how no matter what happened externally, the happiest, most loving, connected in every situation, like all the time. And it, it, it's like, it almost broke me as, as a kid. Like, and you stack that on top of like, I tell people deployments, like going into a coma you didn't sign mm. up for. Because for me, my life went on every day when I was deployed, but I checked boxes, I did blank, but I lived in such an isolated container. And then you come home after 13 months and you realize there's people that you knew who didn't know each other that now have a three-month-old child and that all happened when you hmm. were gone. And then you're like, oh my God, it's so good to see you. And you do dinner, right? And then you do your dinner and then their whole life 
goes on. They're like, oh, it's so good to see George after being deployed. And they go do dinner. And then my whole world class. I'm like, I missed an entire 13 months of like that. And then like that, I sat in that, I sat in that shadow for probably like eight years. That was probably the biggest, biggest struggle of like my, my quote unquote PTSD Hmm. wasn't any of that stuff or any of the stuff I saw. It was like collapsing the gift of humanity and presence and seeing such beautiful things in some of the darkest, darkest parts of the world. But then while experiencing those things, realizing that it feels like everybody knows you're gone and everybody knows you're gone, but then they still have their life and moments too. And then like, you come back and I'm like, I don't even know what to liken it to. I'm like, I don't know, like a coma on a spaceship with Chris Pratt and Jennifer Lawrence Mm. when they wake each other up. Like, I don't know, like one of those things, but then it's always led to the most beautiful place because all I remember is those smiles of those kids. Like I remember buying gum off one of them and it's a group of four-year-olds who have an eight-year-old as a Mm. parent and they're hawking gum. And I'm like, but the conversations and I found photos of them the other day when I was moving offices and I walked through every one of them and I remember every one of them. And it's like that moment Mm. that you just referenced that when you said that that's what happened in my body, all of it, like every thought, every memory, every kid, Eritrea, Ethiopia, Sudan, Zambia, Tanzania, Kenya, like everywhere I went, I'm like, that and i think it's one of the most beautiful gifts that's almost unexplainable to people when you when you can feel that and see that and then and be witness to that so i don't know if that went anywhere but mm. i just felt called to share that no if uh, thank you for for sharing that and what <clears throat> what immediately comes up for me is like how how we can be <clears throat> caught up in our own you know perspective of reality in our ivory tower in our silos in some way and really recognizing that there are billions and billions and billions of beings out there that are having their own unique experience that can relatively appear, you know, worse. And at times, you know, practically it's, it's worse than what you, what a lot of people have in the world, but acknowledging that life is alive in those spaces, there is still joy. There's still sadness. It's a relative experience. And, that, and it's like, how do we even comprehend the, the depth and gravity and magnitude of that. It's profound. Yeah. That, that, that is what like, it, it's just like a, it, it's a shadow collapsing mm. moment to bring presence. It's just like, I, I, I just had Mike Rubin on the show before you um, today, an incredible entrepreneur. And, and he said something so easy. He's like, he's like, the only reason I don't fail is because I already know what mistakes not mm. to make. Right. And he's like, it's really a series of just make them all until you know what flavor they are. And eventually you run out of mistakes to make and it delineates your choices down. And that's what success looks like. And I was like, bro, like I'm, I'm totally in. And and I feel like my trap for so long was getting trapped in the reflections of the moments Mm. and not remembering how precious they are and how quickly they're fleeting. And it's like, those moments are the ones that I remember that, bring perspective, but also collapse or suck the oxygen out of mine of like, oh yeah, it's so hard today. Right. And it's boom, boom, boom. And it's not that I don't know, or it's there's my body doesn't Mm. remember. Like I'm emotional that day. I'm tired. I'm, I'm blank. I can't remember when my first client left, but it's like these moments. I constantly look for these fortune cookies to suck the oxygen out of all my excuses. Mm. So like they can just pop up or be around me at the right moment. So I can have that. And and it's something it took me years to reconcile. Like I never understood the value of those deployments. Like I never understood the value of those moments or like how those 13 years shaped me to, to be the man I am. And, and so many people give credit to the Marine. It's not the Marine. It's, it's that I became one and what I got to experience and witness because of it. And then those moments, like it's those little moments that I always think of, like when it's like the lowest of the low and I'm like, Oh God, like, that kid, hmm. I remember that kid and his whole mission was to get gum that day so he could have water and we gave him water and we played with him for a while. And then he just went on until the next moment, but nothing else mattered. Nothing else existed. Like it was a true hmm. like moment to moment. And it also hurts my heart to know why moments matter so hmm. much because life is so not guaranteed yeah. for them. It's fleeting. Right. And I feel like the trap that I've fallen into is thinking that it is for hmm. me. But because I have walls around me and a car in the driveway and like that doesn't change if 
I drive up the street and an elk jumps in front of me today and Georgie's no more. Mm -hmm. Right. And I feel like those moments, like that perspective creates this beautiful dance as you would put Mm it, where it's like every time I dance with the light, I know I'm also dancing with the darkness and it's just the willingness to do the dance and if I step on toes or my own, remove them and keep mm. leading, but don't stop dancing. Cause I had this explained and someone asked at the event and I didn't do this explanation. Somebody else did like, how do you eradicate, you know, darkness? And they were like, well, just imagine a cup of water. Right. And I was like, yeah. And he's like, if I take that water and then I put sand in the water and I, the sand drops to the bottom, I can pour as much fresh water in there and bucket at a time, cup at a time. That water will stay dirty. The only way that that dirt gets out of that water is if I keep pouring in a consistent stream of fresh water and eventually Mm -hmm. all that dirt will work its way out. But the moment I stop, it settles right back down to the bottom. And I feel like it's this constant dance of like pouring the water in Mm -hmm. to get it out. Oh, am I? Is this perspective right? Is it not? Am I doubting it? And then the water starts pouring and then this one catches up. I'm like, no, no, pour, 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 pour. And so it's all these like perspective shifting moments to allow myself at least to keep pouring into the water, to pour into the bucket, to pour in from a place of love, Mm. to pour in from a place of presence, from a place of gratitude, knowing that the only darkness or dirt that I get to get out of my cup is my own dirt that gets in the way of me pouring water into other people's cups. Right. But it's all that perspective that all happened in my head when you Mm. said that story. Wow. (laughs) I, I, I love that. And what immediately comes up for me is, when we were, you know, in, in, in South India and in this, it was a, a, this golden temple. It was literally a golden temple with a, a, a macabre star um, path around it. And the, the puja, so the puja is the, 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 the ritual ceremonies that were taking place. Just this devotion, these prayers, these chantings, the abhishekim, the, the pouring of the like milk over a statue of the goddess and this, this cleansing, this ritualistic cleansing of a, of a symbol, which is actually reflective of the, the cleansing and purification of your soul. Right. And I think this is what we're speaking to here. It's like being in devotion and offering and this darkness is there, but you're honoring it and you're releasing it and you're cleansing it and you're being in this cycle. It's, and it's a dance. It's, it's the cycle and the rhythm that actually gives birth to creation, right? And we can't have the life without the death, the light without the dark, the male without the female. They're on a spectrum together. And I think when we're cognizant of that and we're in the flow of that, it becomes art. It becomes presence. Otherwise, it becomes something that we're trying to analyze or judge or compartmentalize inside of a box. And that is the antithesis of what life really is. Well then, and I love this and boy, do I have a question now. So in that same lens of like, it's art when we paint Mm. and then knowing you and your creative process, where's there a finish line to where the canvas goes from behind the closed door Mm. into the world? Mm. Like, where's that line? Because like, I agree Mm. with you and I feel like what I've relegated myself to is that I don't have walls in the studio anymore. I just paint in front of you. Mm because I feel like I've always struggled with that, like in what you're saying, Oh, I'm going to create this thing. I'm going to have that thing. But then that analyzation Mm -hmm. dance happens. Mm -hmm. Right. And the, is the whole word. And even the post I referenced earlier, I'm like, Oh, there's more, there's more, there's more. And what's so crazy is I wrote that post on last Tuesday and I wrote it to post Wednesday Mm -hmm. and then it ended up getting posted today because I sat on it and kept moving the starting line and moving. And then it turned into something beautiful today, but I didn't choose to put it off. The container Mm -hmm. I dropped into kind of pulled me out of it. And so what is your dance like with the creative process? Mm, Such a, such a great question. Like I, I feel like these, these, these creative acts, these seeds that emerge into you know, ideas, projects, paintings, songs, posts, writings, whatever it might be, like they have a life of their own, right? So there's some creations that just desire to emerge into the world as they're being, as they're being birthed, which is so beautiful and so natural. And then there's some creation that almost like 
needs to hibernate or, or, or incubate in some capacity under the soil. Like it's, yeah. it's like it's there, like it's taking its time and it's ready to birth. And I guess it's knowing that when it's time to birth that versus that point where it can start to rot and become entropic as yeah. well. So there's no linearity to it. Mm. I think that I think that's that's the answer. Is is it's a uh, I guess it's like having a garden, yep. right? Like only you can look at the garden and know what needs water, what needs pruning, and then what gets to go in. And then that leads me to another question, though, is so then for you and your process, like how have you learned? Like I feel like I make up stories about you and your process because mm. I know you so well, but also your brain, and and I make up that with the paradox of knowing that you have like the the paradox of knowledge like the depth of knowledge the depth of understanding right like you and i can have i can have intelligent questions for you in probably 12 buckets of expertise that i listen and take notes from and i'm like yeah Nikhil, preach bro take me to church take me to church take me to church right and so how do you develop or how have you personally seen like your relationship with that from a lens of like self-trust mm. and knowing all of that work and, and all of those pieces? Like, how do you reconcile the depth of what you know and how much you know <laughs> versus how much to put on the plate or when to put on the plate? Oh, what, a, what a powerful question. Um, I, I reconcile it with, with, with challenge. Uh, it feels challenging. Um, at, at, yeah. at times when there's this creative tension of a, a birthing of a world because your creativity, my creativity, it is a world in itself. And the resistance that can arise when that part of me it wants it to be out into the world and be in the place and doing the thing, but an inner knowing that it's, it's not the time just yet. Trust, surrender to the seasons. I'm still learning how to reconcile that because it's an emergent process. Well, I feel like too, though, what I notice so well is that, because like we, we talk quite mm. often, but the first thought that came to my head was like for me, because I asked that question selfishly, but then I heard my answer mm. in your answer and i was like oh well well no the only way to develop that trust is to actually create more art right it's actually just to create more art because like one of the things that i i i genuinely admire about you and i feel like where you keep me sharp is to the commitment to your mm -hmm. practices right like even if they they bow and change like you're the guy like i've never known you to check a box of like oh i did my morning routine right like you mm -hmm. embody it you feel it but you also flow with the season of of them changing but it sounds like that whenever you're the season may change and the gardens in a different season you're like okay cool well now i get to start planting in this season but you always start with you and your practice and you you always protect the art even if the medium changes or even if the paint strokes change. You find a new way to like whip out the pages again and do your two morning, pro two pages in the morning, or I'm going to go do this. Right. So like, what's your relationship like with, like you were talking about in India, you know, their devotion mm. and, and their practices and, and you're someone I feel like just as a, as a human, but even in our worlds together and as mm. Raya and where I know you in the world, right? Like you are meticulous from the outside in with the integrity and the discipline around the outcome of your practice, mm -hmm. not the practice itself. And so does that feel like it plays a big role for you or like, what's your relationship like with your practices or even your relationship with yourself before you go create? Hmm. That's a, such a, such an incredible question. It, what, what, it, what it feels like is that my, like my core perspective is that, this this life, how I'm living my life, it is the it is the brush strokes on the canvas of creation, mm -hmm. right? And the the texture, the the texture and the depth, which is possible because of the shadow, allows me to actually flow with how life wants to express in real time. And when I am priming myself, i.e., giving me the core foundational things that I need to feel safe enough to create and express myself, i.e., you know, sleep, um, phenomenal nutrition, and mm -hmm. being in dialogue with creation, 
for me, that is foundational to trust that the creativity that emerges in the day is what desires to create. Because some days I don't feel creative, but I'm always creating. You're always creating. Mm-hmm. Like it doesn't, it doesn't stop. Mm-hmm. We are creation in motion, Mm-mm. right? So it's like I'm learning more how to attune to my own cycles where I feel more, sometimes more productive, there's a greater output. And where there's sometimes it's like, it, there's not much output, but there's such a deep churning and creative integration that's taking place and feeling okay with that, feeling good with that. That's, that's where I'm, I'm, I'm dancing with. I think that's the secret. Yeah. yeah. I like, I love that. Like your answers just tickle yeah. me. I'm like, yep, that's what I do. I'm like, yep. Oh, okay. Yep. I feel that too. I think the thing that you said too, the two things that I want to highlight that really particularly tickled for me are we're constantly creating, even if it doesn't look like we mm-hmm. are 100% of the time. And then the second part is you get to be okay with whatever that painting yeah. looks like. And it always reminds me because like I look at artists who actually paint, right? And I'm, I'm blessed to be, God has just surrounded me with some of the most incredibly talented people. And I've watched a few of them paint. And I was like, why is that thing like that? They're like, oh, that's just the base. And like, what? And I'm like, your painting has like 800 layers of paint on it. They're like, bro, what do you think? It looks like that when we start. I'm like, that's what I thought. I thought you just started painting and you made it look like that thing that somebody pays money uh-huh. for. And I was like, wait, you just painted that whole canvas black. And he's like, yeah, I'm probably going to go over it like 20 more times and figure out the back color. And then it's like layer yes. upon layer. And I was like, my mind broke. Like it broke. Mm. Cause it broke my linear understanding of like what it takes to make mm. art. Or the first time I saw a friend make a song and my whole career because of my own wounds was I'm a one and done or I have to do it perfect. Mm -hmm. Right. It's boom, it's boom, it's boom. And like, even this season, Oh, we out here now this season. Um, I now watch every one of my own videos before I post Mm -hmm. it. And this is within the last six months and nobody knows why I never used to watch my own content. And everyone's like, I'm like, Oh, I don't watch it. I don't watch it. And they're all just, they just assume they just make up (laughs) Oh, it's because he just wants to keep creating. No, I was scared mm. to watch my own content. It made my body shiver. Like I would get nauseous. I would get self-conscious. I would get massively, massively self-aware and self-deprecating before I watched it. And like, I'd start to hear my voice and my voice would shift and I'd be like, what the, and I couldn't watch it. And, um, you know, my personal life and what's been going on. And, and about a year ago when, when things started to really, really come into play, but even a lot of what you're sharing where I like spent that time to know who I am and made whatever I created. Okay. What it really gave me was a permission slip to just speak authentically, Mm. not this is one piece of content or this is here. I have to get it all in one. And without even realizing it, I would record a piece of content. And then one day I noticed I was watching everything I recorded. And I was like, huh, no, do it again. Hmm. No, no, that didn't feel right to you. I'm like, if you didn't feel that, they're not going to feel it. And it took me a couple months to realize that I had like shifted through. And the answer for me was like really like radical self-love. But it drastically, drastically changed my process and the results that I create and my ability to look at my art. And know like when I dance and don't dance. And it, it's new for me. Like it's really, really new. Even Ashley's like, do you know how much easier it is to do your content now? I'm like, well, yeah, because like I record it and I didn't like it. So I redid it and I can tell you what's in it. I was like, yeah, because it's like I'm giving the time and care to my art mm. that it always deserved. That I couldn't give it before because I made myself unworthy as an artist over and over and over again. Right. And I was so attached to that like it's got to be one and done it, that I wouldn't mm. even look. And so it's like, I would paint a painting and then I'd be like, here it goes. I'm never looking mm. at it again. Nope. Don't even want to see it. Don't know. I made it. I don't, I don't want to know. And I was like, I've yet to meet a photographer who puts photos on the wall that doesn't yeah. like their own photos or, you know, a painter who ends their own painting in their house. And I was like, Oh, and so I just had to really start noticing and, and collapsing down that like, This is my Mm. art, right? Like when I make a video, it's my art. When I write words, it's my art. And in that, it's okay to post it if that's what I feel like is the expression of my art that day. 
but I think I should look at my own art if I'm really, really proud of it before I share mm. it with the world or else it's never going to land with the world. Mm. Well, your, your art is literally the reflection of you, right? So we're willing to look at ourselves and, and love ourselves and all of it and sometimes make changes, sometimes adapt. <laughs> well, like I got, I got, and I love them. I love them to pieces but i was doing content and i recorded a video and someone sent me a message and they're like i can't watch this i can't even listen to you i'm just telling you because you remind me of this woman that used to like reading rainbow shows and and i was like really like triggered for a minute huh. i'm like i would they caught me in a down moment and i responded i'm like and they're like you can give me feedback on this and i was like well right and i did that and then she's like whoa and then i was like i'm so sorry i don't know what's going on blah, blah, blah. and then we talked through it and then i watched the video and i was like Oh, <laughs> I felt that way too. And then I was like, well, now I have a Halloween costume for this year because I'm going to dress up as said character. But then I like had a good chuckle and I was like, God, thanks for the feedback. Like, thank you for telling me that I put a giant black stroke across the most beautiful part of my mm. painting. I didn't realize that I accidentally spilled that paint on the way out the door. Thanks for telling me before I hang it up on the wall. And I was like, and it's just like these like little, little reframes. And I've even like reframed them. Like when I get feedback, they're just protecting my mm -hmm. art. It's all they're mm -hmm. doing. The world's just telling me that I missed yes. a spot on my painting. And I'm like, well, great. I'm not going to miss it next time. I'll put it back up. Mm. Let's go. Mm. And see so your art, all of your art contributes to the grand masterpiece that life is creating together, right? So it's like this, it's growing and synergizing and evolving together and we will get that feedback and it's beautiful. Like that's part of being an artist, dancing and feeling how the currents of life are moving us to more deeply express ourselves because the art, whether it's a video or a painting or a book, whatever it might be, that's a living, breathing organism and the people receiving it are also living and breathing and they're also the same being. <laughs> Right, it's all one interconnected yes. thing. And since this is Giorgio, George's couch of like divulging all of his shadows that come up with his brother Nikhil, because I forgot we were recording like 10 minutes ago. And I'm like, this is what like me and Nikhil talk about. Like this was the before combo too. I also realized, Nikhil, I was never taught a relationship mm -hmm. with progress. I was only taught a relationship with rigidity mm -hmm. because of my life and my childhood, right? And so that that trauma response of like survival mm. was every decision had safety on the other side of it. Right. That was it. It was like, am I going to have a bed tonight or not? Am I going to have mm. food tonight or not? Like this one decision I make <laughs> is the decision that might be there. And then I didn't account that I went in the Marine Corps on top of it. But one dirty little shadow I have that I've always been jealous of is like when I watch people like make outlines for a presentation, then come back to it mm. or they'll write down, 20 words and be like, I'm going to come back to this. And like, I'm going to break down in tears right now. I didn't even know how to do that until a year ago, a year ago. And everyone's like, why are you so obsessed as a consultant? Like, why do you learn all these things and teach them to you? Well, I got to teach myself some way, some way. And so like most of my consulting came from me, like literally being jealous of everybody. And I'm like, how do they do this? Like, why does their brain work like this? Like, why can they go write five pages? and make progress on their book. And I feel like I can't write one unless I write the whole book in one mm. day. Like this shadow, I've never talked about this ever. Mm. It was a prison, bro. Mm. And it was like sneaky, sneaky, because it's so easy to justify when I'm like, oh, Nikhil needs it right now. No, 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 right? And it, 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 it can get so justified. And I'm like, what am I missing? What am I missing? And I just, I just figured out that I was never taught like how to think and work in, in process. Mm -hmm. I was, most of my life was conditioned to be in fight or flight. And so I'm like, no, no, you can't run more than one race at a time. What do you mean? And they're like, bro, there's mile markers, right? Like you can take a break, right? Like, you know, like when they give us a photo project, they give us 12 months to take all those photos. And I'm like, what do you mean? We can be done today. Mm -hmm. Like, why not just be done today, right? And there's this fear built into the finish line. Like, if I didn't finish, I was unsafe. Mm. If it wasn't complete, I was unsafe. And so even this conversation is very, very fucking therapeutic mm. for me. 
<laughs> because I also am like best friends with you and I watch you in your process. And, and in that, I, I miss those moments because for me, the feeling, and, and I'm sharing this in case this lands or resonates with anybody, but most of the time, like when we're on this podcast and I get a text, my first body's response is that has to be done in the next mm-hmm. minute, right? That's the default muscle that's installed. And over time I've learned to like work and like outcomes and protect my space, but it's all that same, the one and done, the one and done. And the worst part about that trauma is that it has the built in trap of there's a finish mm. line at every single decision, which is not mm. true in any way shape or form (laughs) and so the game the game was completely unwinnable and earlier when i asked you you're like i'm still integrating this i'm like hi my name's george this one is the the sneakiest slipperiest one but that's the one that i've been unpacking and like really reflected on because now it's like i have notes in my notebook and i like it's gonna be weird but i look down i'm like oh look at those things i'm like halfway done with that thing and i'm excited to come back Mm. to it and it's like the baby steps about it, but it's it's helping me learn my relationship with my art. And I'm like, you know what? That canvas looks really good right there. I don't have anything to add to it right now. I'm going to go start a new one. And if I decide to come back to this one, I'll come back to this one. But it, it's like, uh, it's visceral in my body. It's still visceral in my body sometimes. Thank you for the honor of witnessing you in the in the elimination of that shadow. Right. It's, I'm sure like, I mean, I, 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 I relate, I, I relate the, 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 the trauma, the survival, the way that we are primed to act and react in the world and, and how life is really beckoning us to, to play, to be, to be a muse for us, to, to dance with and, and create and tend to the garden of creation and, and knowing the nuance of each piece of art and trusting it and, that is the invitation, brother, and you are a phenomenal artist and teacher, and it's beautiful, beautiful to witness you. Oh, my God, brother. I Well, I feel the same about you, and I'm still learning every day how to paint like you paint because your paint colors, bro. <laughs> like, they, they got glitter and unicorns fucking streaked across your canvas somehow. Like, you paint a brushstroke and a unicorn rides across it when you're done. And I'm like, that's because my vocabulary is not really caught up. But then it's the embody. And that's the other thing, too. It's not the words you use. Fuck it. I haven't said this. I'm going to say this right now. Uh -uh Uh-uh-uh. It's that every word you use, you are fully embodied underneath every one of them. Like, when you use a word and learn a word, like, I feel like you don't use it until it's who you Mm. are or the state of being you're operating from. And so it's like your dictionary only works when it's installed into you. But that's not normal because like you say words and I only know what they mean because of how you're being with them. And like that muscle, Mm. we can bottle that muscle up or figure out that level of integration and muscle. Like that's the one that I see in you the Mm. most. And I'm like, no, bro. Like, it's not that you were you were you use the word loquacious if that's even a word I don't know I might have made that up but it's like when you use it like I feel the feeling mm. of the word. Well, Does it that makes make sense? it makes total sense and it brings up one very very important piece I think that we we we, we look at right now how how you're feeling in any given moment directly translates into art right whether mm. whether it's a you know a painting that you know that's infused with anger and rage or ecstasy or uh, a story that gives a deep sense or a, a window into your soul, how you're feeling when you're connected to your medium, that's what gets translated through. And I guess whatever gift that I have been given to translate how I'm feeling into words, that's something that is, it's been given by grace. And because I'm just being congruent with my expression because I feel safe, to authentically express myself with you. I just happen to have collected some, some words and some seeds on my journey, being a journeyman through this life that gets to be expressed in this living, breathing art. That's this conversation. Yeah. Well, you know, it's so funny, that Facebook post that I just told uh, you about, right? The whole reason I wrote it is because I don't think 
most people realize that they're creating art in every moment based on how they feel. Mm. And I was scrolling through Facebook and I saw this incredible post from a woman about her coaching program and how gratitude matters and loving your clients. And, and I was like, I am in. I was like, like, comment. I don't even know her. We're just friends on Facebook. And then the Facebook magical algorithm happened. And then it showed me a post from three days earlier and a post from like seven days later in the next half an hour, right? And one of them was complaining and gaslighting a client three days before that post came. Hmm. And then like six days later, it was complaining about something in the world and it hurt my heart because it break checked me instantly. And I wasn't, I was like, oh, this woman's not trying to do this. Like she genuinely believes in her message, but the half-life of one social mm. post is like 30 seconds mm, right mm. now. And we think in this isolated container, but if we were to take 30 of those posts in a row and put them on a table in front of us, would they match? Mm. Would they be consistent? Would they be congruent? Maybe not in what's on the canvas, but the artist itself, right? And it just led me down this really deep rabbit hole about the power of our words and how what you just said about like we're constantly creating art on how many times I didn't recognize I was and I was still putting brush strokes on the canvas and they were fighting against the art that I was trying to sell in the gallery. Hmm. Because I was measuring in a window that was too small and I wasn't taking into account relationships yes. and art and journey and knowing that we're going to have emotional moments and we're going to have those things. But it's also when we have them, how we choose to put them on canvas that either mm. supports our art and our career or hinders it and turns people off of our art because they got a window into the process that happens behind the canvas that they don't always see because it leaked out. And so it's like this big thing on consistency and congruency. And so that's what started mm. as three words and then ended up as like 6,000 offshoots <laughs> about like conditioning and behaviors and the spiral effect. And like, I watched a video yesterday and, and, you know, I go to church every morning. I watch my pastors every morning, my relationship with God. And he was talking about how frustrated he got because one of his best friends was an, was an atheist. And he's like, and I, he asked me about Easter. And so I was just sharing from my heart. And I invited him and he was like, just shutting me down. I didn't even know why I asked like this frustrated me for four years, four years. It drove me nuts. Cause I'm like, why did he ask? Why did he ask? And then he's like, and it wasn't until four years later I figured it out because I got off stage and I was coming up and a family came up to me and a gentleman said, do you have a minute? And he's like, of course I do. And he's like, I need to tell you something. He said, four years ago, I saw you in a coffee shop and I was cleaning the bathroom right outside where you were having the conversation because I worked at that coffee shop and you were talking to one of your friends and your friends had asked you about Easter like he was open. And then every time you gave him an answer, he shut you down and shut you down and shut you down. And he's like, I heard you. And I grabbed my family that next day. And we came to your church that Sunday. And we've been members since. And our life is so great. And I know it took me a long time, but I just want to say thank you for saying that to mm. your friend. And like, we forget about those moments. Like we forget that every time we put a piece of art into the world, it's leaving an impression, mm. whether intentional or unintentional. And there's this like level of relationship that I have with my words now or like what I say and how I say it because I think about that and I, I think all too often or forever, I just forgot that I was putting brush strokes on the canvas, whether I was intending to or not or whether I was thinking about it or not based on how I felt mm. and the words that I was using to express that. And the world sees that art every single day. My kids see it. My ex-wife sees it. You see it. I put it in videos. I put it in all of it. And I just think about the, the fleeting moments where a temporary feeling allowed me to change the brushstroke of my hand or change the color I put on. And then because I didn't look at that art or because I wouldn't sit in that video. And by the way, the reason I couldn't watch the videos is because they'd make me nauseous because I was out of alignment somewhere. Mm. And I know what it was. I was giving everybody advice that I was too afraid to take mm. for myself. So I was hiding in Solomon's paradox, right? I just didn't recognize it. And I also learned through teaching. And so that trap 
trap was there, but that's what inspired that post was like even thinking about all the pieces that you just shared, which just even forgetting about the power that art has, even if you hung it in a coffee shop 20 years ago and somebody comes and buys a coffee today, that art still matters and still leaves a moment and still leaves a memory. And so like, there's this part that like, I think about now where there's like this, it's like, I owe my art me to think about it like this way so that it can be art and it's not destructive mm. in the process. Mm. And can we have heart without art, the arts and the heart, right? And when our heart is open, then we experience life as art and creativity. And that's the etymological thread right there. The epitomological, <laughs> whatever that word is. I can't ever say it in that context. I can say it the regular way. I can't say it. Can you say that again? The etymological. Etymological. Yeah. There we go. Etymological. Yes. Okay. We're yes. good now. We out here now, as Kevin Hart would say. We out here now. I love how you get me to do, Nikhil. Like, we're on this podcast. My chair is turned sideways, and I don't have any arms on this chair. <laughs> and I've, like, done a 180 over here with you. And I'm, like, sitting Indian style now with my back. I'm like, no, no. I love this. This is amazing. I love you, brother. I love you, too. You're in your in your avatar lotus form right there. I am. I, <laughs> I am. Dancing in the paradox, brother. And, you know, here we are. Um, though I want to close the loop on one thing I asked you earlier, because I asked what your biggest mm -hmm. takeaway mm -hmm. was from mm -hmm. India, and then the one that you're you're currently mm -hmm. like in process with, yeah. whether for you or in mm -hmm. business or anything. But I would kind of love to hear like what you're working on or in or integrating. Yeah. Like just yeah. yeah, the the one that I'm integrating is the like how we globally interconnect and weave together in more meaningful ways. There was deep conversation around, you know, interdependent systems, um, re rege planetary regeneration, the soil, like how can we open source? So something unlocked there physically being in India that I've taken with me as a, a deeper contemplation around, okay, if we are really doing this here on this planet as heart-centered human leaders, if we are truly bridging heaven and earth into a more whole now, it looks like really deep dynamic um, collaboration, you know, and, and coherence. And yeah, a lot has opened up with that. And I'm kind of sitting with that. Like, how do we do this better? How do we take this seriously while still having fun and weaving as a global body? That's what's, what's alive for me. I love that. Well, actually, because um, we do have to land this at some point or else we'll do this for 12 hours, but we'll do another one sooner than later. Um, but we've mentioned Asraya a few mm. times and we mentioned the beginning and we talk about community. And, and in my opinion, you are one of the greatest at thinking about community, creating them, creating that shared mm -hmm. experience. And the most important part for me is having it be around something centrally located or shared and not around you or the yes. creator, like you genuinely create supportive communities. So can you give everybody just a quick overview of like what we do in mm. Asraya, just so everybody has an awareness? Because I say it all the time, but I've never like explained it. And I'm like, well, I should talk to the guy, you know, who founded it with my best friends and, and have him explain it because he's here. Mm. And so if you want to explain to everybody what it is, so everybody knows what we're talking yeah, about. Yeah, of, of course. And look, at like at the core, Asraya, it's a Sanskrit word that means refuge, shelter, base. So Beyond anything, that's what it is. It's a safe space for um, the weird, wonderful, heart-centered entrepreneurs, visionaries, creators to, to gather and dream together a new world. So that's, that's really what Asraya is. And it's definitely in an emergent process. We're experimenting. We're learning what it takes to align busy, creative, dynamic beings around a shared vision and to actually do it whilst also picking up the insights and learning, you know? So um, there's that component to it being, as I'm seeing it, like a, an R&D lab for human consciousness and community building. Um, but in a very tangible sense, it is a, um, a platform and a community of, you know, leaders, visionaries, change makers coming together to learn, um, to, to create, to unite and to thrive and to embark on a quest together. Um, that's really what it's about. And, there's just phenomenal people in the space. We get to learn and grow from each other. And 
And the, the vision is to build the tangible infrastructure and protocol that can support not just Asraya, but all the other ecosystems and communities that are on the same path to come together and to truly to elevate. And it's a big, ambitious, audacious vision, but it came from a deeper part of my being, from a higher plane. And that's the art that's kind of weaving through me right now. And George was our second founding citizen, you know, so. Uh, that's because my buddy up the street beat me by like 30 <laughs> seconds. I mean, it, and I love him, but he gets to be first. But he texted me and I was so mad. Well, I'm glad that you're, you're, you're both here. And look, you're all, with the Sriya, each being is a seed that turns into a plant, a fruit bearing tree in the larger ecosystem of a garden that we get to create together and we get to taste each other's fruits and we get to share our energy through the mycelium layer. Really, that's what a Sriya is. We're not trying to create anything from scratch. We're replicating and flowing with nature and creation because for me, that feels the most congruent way to be in the world. Oh, bro. I love watching you create. Like I, I, I feel like if I had a dream, I could just take a, a, a fly on the wall seat. If I could get paid to just watch you build and be your hype man, like I'm in, I'm in, I'll throw some, I'll throw some questions out to get you grounded, but then I'll just help you paint with the world, bro. I'm let's, in. Let's, let's, let's do that, brother. I mean, I could, yeah. Like you, you catalyze me in a way that not many people can. And thank you for seeing me and for being an ally on this journey, brother. It's a, uh, it's a gift beyond words, truly. Brother, I will tell you, one of my greatest gifts in my life is you. Like the, the messages that you send me, though I have more of your videos and messages saved in my rainy day folder on my phone, I think, than anybody. And I'm like, and it's not even when you intend to. Hmm. It's just you're thinking of me and just dropping this like poetic song that needs 8 billion streams on Spotify the moment you release it to me. And then I'm like, this is my moment, but I want to tell like a thousand people about this moment. No, I'm just going to soak all this in. Jesus, what are you doing to my nervous system, Akil? I'm like, thanks for teaching me how to receive. Like, holy moly. And like, I love when you check me when I'm like, oh, you're so, and you're like, you're just a PO. I'm like, no, I'm not. And then I send you back the video and I watch it. I'm like, wow. Wow, maybe I am. And like, I just love how embodied you are in everything that like your presence lovingly calls me up to a greater presence mm. of my own. Mm. Like, that's what it feels like to be your friend, bro. Like just your existence sharpens me, but it feels like mother ayahuasca or God is carrying me on a fluffy pillow, no matter how loud mm. it is. When you say things, they just, they bypass every filter and just get installed straight on the heart with no other things that get in the way. That's what it feels like when I receive your messages, bro. Thank you, brother. And I feel exactly the same. So what? So whatever is happening here, I'm so fucking grateful for it because pff, it's a gift beyond words. Truly, you're a gift. Well, I'll... But brother, I feel the same and I'll tie it in for everybody too, because if you're listening to this, then the episode uh, with Mike Rubin was already up and, and the thing in Mike is a savage. Like I think his fund, um, North Pond Ventures, I think they're a $60 billion fund. And I asked him about the secret to relationships and he's like, it's really, really easy. There's two buckets. Bucket number one is the critical few and bucket number two is to be of use to everybody else. And I was like, huh? And then he started breaking it down and the critical few are the use of the world and the me's of the world, the ones that we should be getting feedback from. And he said, think about the amount of times you post on social, but you never get enough mm. likes. But if you open that post, all your critical few liked it. So who are you mm. looking for feedback from? Because if my kids and my friends like you, if I put something on social and I see that you liked it, I'm done. Mm -hmm. I don't have anything else to prove. That's one of my critical few. Everyone else will come around wherever. And he's like, but you got to pour into the relationships and into the critical few that don't only support you, but just their presence brings the most out of you in your business, in your family, in your relationships and surround yourself with those. Take feedback from those like, if you want to call somebody, call them. I just avoided it for so <laughs> long because my body wasn't ready to hear what you had to say because I had to let it in. I got to let it in and our relationship developed over the years and then instantly went to level 10,000 <laughs> of depth and hasn't left since. And so I think it's, I think it's so profound and I think it really just 
boils down to what we talked about. It's like finding the present moment to choose where to spend your time. And then when you're choosing to spend it, are you spending it in a way that's serving you? Is it serving your art? Is it making you a better artist or more excited to paint in your way, whether it's a podcast, written word, anything else? Or it could be in your business or how you lead your team or what things you share with them. Like art is so subjective and so many ways in which we can express it and share it. But our job in this world, our job on the planet is to, in my opinion, is to paint with the paints that we've been given on the canvas that we have or the medium that we choose. And then surround yourself with relationships that help you paint more, that when you talk to them, they make you feel like a better painter. When you hear from them, they inspire you to use different words. When you think of them, it makes you want to try something crazy that you've never tried before because you know your critical few are there. And so for me, whatever creative means for you, whether it's words like Nikhil and I spoke today, whether it's a podcast, whether it's a painting, whether it's writing an email, whether it's building the best tech for a funnel that you could ever build, that's your art. But when you're in that art, utilize yourself as the artist, knowing no one else can paint it like you can, but also those people that you surround yourself with, the conversations that you have, you're constantly creating art, whether you intentionally mean to or not, as Nikhil so said. And so in my opinion, the thing that makes art beautiful that you shared is that art always comes from emotion and the heart. And sometimes for me, when I'm in the rawest of emotion, I can get stuck in that trap. And it's those critical relationships around me that are like, George, paint. George, post the song. And you hear him enough that you just start trusting it. And then you spend the rest of your life best friends with these people. And you get on calls, whether they're recorded or not. And I will tell you that our phone conversations are the same. Our FaceTimes are the same. Our text message is the same, and it's a whole lot of thanks for the reminder, let's go paint. Thanks for the reminder, let's go paint. And I think that that's the beauty in it all. And so I just, I genuinely appreciate you sharing so much of your heart, man, and just being in my life and, and being so incredible and, and constantly reinventing yourself for the betterment. And like, I have that beautiful seat of being number two in Asraya, which I'm proud of. And, and I feel like that's where I belong in the world is everybody's number two. And, uh, and also, you know, with you guys in partnership and, and helping to grow it. And, and it's an incredible thing to witness two of the most powerful men that I know that are heart centered and living examples, birth something of creation and be the examples in front of me as well that I get to learn from and support from as well with us, Raya. And so like, I turned this whole podcast into a gratitude hmm. session for you, but I, uh, I genuinely, genuinely appreciate it. So I just, I want to do this because obviously I'm going to tag you everywhere. I'm going to do everything, but I want people to connect with you. And by the way, he's mine. Everybody just stop right now. Just before you get it in your head, my endowment is deep and this one I'll fight for. You can try. You can try. But you ain't getting this one. You can come, you can come borrow some of Nikhil, but I'm, I'm keeping him selfish. Now I'm just kidding. I'll share him with everybody because he's got love to share. But where's the absolute, like your favorite place for people to connect with you? Mm, yeah. So you could find me on, on Instagram at primal.alchemy or you can, yeah, you can visit my website and nikhilkale.com and just follow the contact link through there and happy to connect. Yeah. And I'd say Instagram is great. And most of our peeps mm -hmm. listen to Instagram. So if I remember yours is primal dot alchemy, yeah. right? Yeah. So it's P R I M A L dot. And then A L C. How do you spell alchemy? Oh yeah. A L C H E M Y. <sighs> See, I'm learning, bro. Take me to, take me to school. I can't, I can't spell that other at, at, at Tamala, that one yet, but we're good with alchemy. And then if you guys want to check out his website, we'll have everything linked in the show notes. And Nikhil and I are constantly together. He's in the Alliance with us. He's, he's my brother. You will see him. You'll be around him. We will do many more podcasts, but if you want to go to his website, I'll spell it for you. I'll, I'll spell it just to make it easy. Um, but it's Nikhil Kale. So it's N I K H I L K A L E.com. Right. Perfect. Okay. Well, I'm glad I know how to spell my <laughs> friend's names. That makes sense. I'm winning my art today, bro. I'm winning my art. I spelt your name correctly. I win. Beautiful. Oh, there yeah. we go. Okay. I, was, I saw the fist pump yeah. and then it came in slow. And so <laughs> I do want to ask you one final question, my friend, to land the plane before I go get my little one from school. Um, 
you know the show, you've been on it, and, and I'll save the whole Men in Black story, but I just want you to envision you can tattoo any departing wisdom on their souls that they take with them forever. What would your tattoo wisdom be for everybody? Hmm. Tattoo wisdom would be hmm, em- embrace the temporal nature of the moment. This life is fleeting. Every moment is a gift. Don't let it fall by the wayside, but embrace it with an open heart and celebrate the art that you are. <sighs> Holy moly. And thanks for the podcast title. Celebrate the art that you are. Bro, you got to end the show with like one of your poetic masteries. So this is what it looks like when Nikhil just puts his stamp of like, hi, my name's Banksy. And every time I speak, everybody wants to spend $20 million on my painting. <laughs> I love it, bro. I will take it all day. I will gash you up all day. I will support you all day. I love you to fucking pieces. Love you more, brother. To pieces. And I just wanted to say it on the recording because I'm going to say it a thousand more times when we hit end in about one minute as well. And so I'm just getting it out publicly so everybody in the world knows. And so for me, I have a different ask for everybody. I have a feeling that you have some very, very deep, critical, close relationships with you that have the ability to go deep and have the ability to change the colors on your canvas or how excited you are to create art. Um, But depth isn't found accidentally. It's created by the person who wants it. And so my invitation for you is to go create depth today. Deep conversations with someone you care about, about your goals, about your mission, about your art, about something beautiful that you want to share or bring to the world and just see if you get a little sharper, you get a little more inspiration or they add a dash of glitters or sprinkles to your paint colors and, and see what happens. But I feel like if you could ask me what the greatest strategy and tactic is to success, it's to have friends like Nikhil. And so go find one, go create one, come grab or leverage one that you have, but take this as the permission slip to just go lean into it because it's not going to lean into itself. And the worst thing you can do is climb a ladder that's leaning up the wrong wall. And I've yet to have a friend like the keel that ever lets me put art into the world that doesn't belong. And so it's a collaborative effort. It's a team effort and everything we create is collaborative for all of us and from us. And so we can leverage all of those things around us to help us make beautiful art in the world. And so the keel said it, I'll say it. I think that's where we win the game, my friend. I think that's where we win the game. So thank you. And for everybody listening, this has been another one of those wild rides on the mind of George show where I genuinely believe it belongs in a straight jacket. So I share the safest parts on the canvas with you called the podcast. And so we'll either uh, see you in the next episode or you'll hear us in your ear bowls, but me and Nikhil are out. So go see him on Insta, slide into his DMs and uh, we'll see you all soon.